Welcome to yet another lovely episode of the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. I fucked up the intro. I'm Joe, and with me is Liam. Jesus Hello, Christ, Liam. man. Hi. I've only been doing this for, you know, almost four years. Uh, to, in, in my defense, this is like the longest we've gone without recording. And because we had a vacation for like the first time ever, we don't do vacations on this show. No, we just sort of endlessly toil away and suffer. If, if serious, like for the first time in three and a half years, I went on vacation. You went on vacation. Um, we recorded a whole bunch before I left, so like nobody noticed. Um, which yeah. is like, uh, you which is how I planned it. Went to, you went to the homeland. Yeah, it was it was, it was lovely. Um, I got my paperwork started uh, um, to get my passport. Uh, my Armenian passport. Obviously, I have a passport. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to get there. Um, I had to get baptized in the church. I was not baptized in the church uh, to prove my Armenianness, uh, which is, ooh, ooh, which that's is a actually fun, that's a fun lack of a wall there. <laughs> yeah, that's like uh, it, ooh, it's state religion. Mm, tasty. It, it's interesting because like most Armenians are not hyper religious. It's just, like a cultural thing. That doesn't shock me. Yeah, like I don't know any like like older people. Like when I went into the the church to get uh, talk to the priest and get baptized it was like only incredibly old people who are actually paying attention and then like in the back of the church is like people playing on their cell phones and stuff <laughs> yeah no i i get that i uh you know it's it's weird man obviously like i think sort of especially as a young adult you sort of fall off i think that's basically inevitable and then you know depending on your life trajectory either you have kids or you know you get older and religion maybe becomes more of a social thing like for my parents, synagogue is incredibly important because it allows them to, you know, maintain a social life in retirement, that sort of thing. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And like, you know, I'm I'm Jewish and I'm I'm going to so I'm fasting in a couple of years uh, and I'm going to fast this year and I'm just going to be like full of hate for the next 24 hours. It's it's incredible. Um, I really hope just we get to, spite to record. Just my Catholic it. girlfriend, just to spite my Catholic girlfriend, because she's like, "Well, when you're hangry, you're a real piece of shit." And I'm like, "Yeah, I know, but God wants me to." Like, did <laughs> I, you I'm create also the, the all the heavens and the earth? No, you didn't, Corinne. I I'm a hor I'm a horrible bitch when I'm hungry. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I really hope we get to record at some point while you're fasting because the amount of verbal abuse just sounds incredible to me. Yeah, it's just like like I I normally am, am you know despite what you may see on Twitter.com a relatively easygoing guy, uh, and then I'm hungry and I'm just like I'm gonna do a hate crime, like <laughs> real <laughs> vile shit. Big, big Philly hours uh, when yeah. you get hungry. <laughs> just, just murdering a Giants man and pleading to the judge, I was hungry. Uh, speaking of hate crimes. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we got a series. So I, me. <laughs> I, I promised everyone a series uh, because we're missing a bonus episode for the month of September. I'm sorry, everybody. It's the first time it's ever happened. Just because like the logistics of trying to get another episode done while trying to get all of our regular episodes done after vacation is just impossible. I'm sorry. So uh, I promise. That's the, well, there's your problem approach. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, 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 get out I'm, they I'm get fucking out. sorry, man. Like I tried. Uh, it's really hard. Like I even planned to record while I was in Armenia and it's really hard to do with like a 16 hour time difference. Yeah. Um, now, when I move there, that's some, that's logistics I'll have to figure out. But like that, that we'll cross the bridge when I get there. But recording on the road sucks ass, dude. Don't ever do it. So I planned a series, um, and I planned a well, series James, sure. that um, is kind of the birthplace of American uh, em- empire, um, and that is the Spanish American War. Oh, cool! This is oh a, a nice light subject. Uh, now as I prepare we, for the fast. We actually um, covered half this kind of already uh, when we covered the uh, American Filo- uh, American Filipino War. Uh, we did a three part series on that forever ago. Um, so that half is taken care of. Otherwise, this series would be way longer, way more unwieldy. Uh, so this will be limited to the Cuban and Puerto Rican theaters of war. Um, and yet we've also talked about uh, how America took over Guam, which was very funny. I, I, I encourage you to to go listen to that series. Um, 
And I had a Filipino uh, activist help me research that because that is a subject I know nothing about. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, for a lot of people who maybe just like kind of glance at American history, the, a lot of people think this is like the first overseas war that America fought. And that's not true. Um, that's actually right. America's first, what some people call America's first global war on terror uh, is the Barbary Pirates Wars. Uh, that, that was America's first overseas war, uh, not counting an attempted invasion of Canada. There's two of them uh, where... We floated all the way over to Tripoli to fight pirates, uh, but also it was kind of sort of part of the Ottoman Empire. So that's a war I tactically support uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, alongside such um, staunch American allies as the Kingdom of Sicily and Sweden. Hey, man, I, hey, I'm Swedish, man, you know? Yeah. Um, I, like now, I don't agree calling this America's first global war on terror because we won. Um, and that's not something we do with, with, with war on terror. Um, yeah. So, it, so again, going forward, I'm not going to really mention the Philippines at all. Um, it's not because I blanked on an entire theater of war because we already covered that for four hours. Right. Uh, so go back, listen to that, fill in the gaps when you're done with this, if, if you're new around here. Um, now the seeds of this war, most people will say that like this war started because the main blew up, the USS main blew up. That is incredibly untrue. No, that's um, true. No, I remember it in school. <laughs> I learned it in school. Yeah, and that's no right. journalism had nothing to do with it. And William Randolph Hearst was a good person. And, and then you just cut my mic. Uh, we will actually get to the yellow journalism bit. Um, it's, it's I something so. that's, we, we like to put a lot of weight on. I strongly disagree with doing that, uh, but we'll get there. Um, now. The, the seeds of this war were planted years before when the Spanish colonized Cuba way back in the 1400s. Um, Spanish rule over Cuba was fucking horrendous and a nightmare show of plantations, institutional brutality, and genocide with slavery thrown in on top. Um, cool. Great. Yeah, there was, it was originally populated by the Taino people who were Arawak, uh, and they're all pretty much gone now for a reason. Um, Spain. Spain did that. Yep. Um, now, if that sounds horribly reductive to you, it's because it is. Uh, give me a break. I have to get through like 400 years of history here. It was bad. Read about it amongst yourselves and come back. Um, <laughs> eventually, people who lived in Cuba got pretty fucking sick of this shit and rose up. Uh, now, at this point, there's Spaniards, uh, there's Cajuns, there is mixed race people, there's uh, slaves, uh, there's a lot of different people who are imported into Cuba, um, and also oh, some of the native population. God, that phrasing, bud. <laughs> um, Man, that's that's yep i mean you're right but yeah um now some of these people were slaves some of these people weren't um so like it's kind of like when you read about haiti um like so, uh, there were slaves and there were mixed race people who were also slave owners and were allowed to elevate themselves into mm -hmm. a middle class it's very it, in comparison to american um uh slavery it's race culture sure. it is much more uh, uh contextual but however Still super fucked up. Don't own people. Yeah, it's it's bad. Uh, slaves bad. They're never a good time to own slaves. No, no, don't do that. Um, now, generally speaking, there's considered to be three different wars of independence. The first being known as the Ten Years' War uh, in 1868. Now, these are organized rebellions or always small scale uprisings, um, because it turns out people don't enjoy being dominated uh, unless you do, and you probably pay for it. Um, mm. Now, the reasons Thank for you, this. Joe. Like real actually, sovereign show. <laughs> I, I guess. I don't know. Uh, it's statewide doming. Um, now, the reasons for this are actually much more nuanced than just like Spain bad, um, though that is, you know, the through line. Mm -hmm. um, there was a growing crisis of, in the place where people were trying to live within an empire that not, did not consider them a colony, but rather a providence of Spain itself. Um, now, if you notice, I said place, not people. Because Spain didn't give a fuck about the people. Um, right. But the French approach to Algeria. Yes. Uh, that's a pretty good. That's, that's actually a pretty good comparison. Um, because while Spain considered Cuba itself a integral part of its empire and a part of Spain, it did not think the same about it, the people that live there. Yeah, it sounds familiar. Um, previously, there had been a ban on slavery, but virtually no enforcement of that ban, leading to tens of thousands of slaves continuing to be imported into the island. Cool. Um, this was made worse by an economic crisis that left a lot of farms and plantations destitute. Uh, the constant importation of slaves shunted out local people who needed work. And if you're a worker, you can't compete with free. Uh, right. So you were left 
penniless. The colonial government of Cuba also randomly began to slap higher taxes on farmers, while at the same time it's beginning to be painfully obvious that their tax revenue is being sent back to Spain or centralized to top the local colonial government, rather than being reinvested back into the island. The Spaniards, rep- Spaniards being the white Spaniards from Spain, um, p- represented 8% of the island's population, while appropriating 90% of the entire island nation's wealth. Christ almighty. Thankfully, that doesn't happen anymore, right? No, 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 no. Now, in addition, Cuban-born population still had no political rights or representation in parliament. The reason why I say Cuban-born and not Cuban-native is because, as we already talked about, the native Arawak people who originally populated the Caribbean, uh, Cuba included, were pretty much wiped out at this point. Um, now, this if you look this up, this is something that you also see in the United States or you know, North America in general, it's incorrectly attributed to something called the virgin soil theory of disease spread. Have you ever heard about this? Is this no, I mean, is this related to uh, us wiping people out just by uh, contact with them? Yes. And I'm getting like smallpox and shit and diseases their immune systems I've just never seen before. Yeah, it's largely untrue. Um, now, oh, that, really? did ha- that did happen. That. It did happen. I'm not saying that like smallpox is more of a vibe, but like so you're telling me that you're a vaccine truther is what I'm hearing. I'm a smallpox truther. I actually don't oh, believe it's real. Interesting. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's a no, um, now, the virgin <laughs> soil theory it mandates that there was no purposeful genocide of natives. Instead, it was accidental based on disease spread. Oh, okay, well, that's bullshit. <laughs> yes. Um, like white people didn't mean to do it. Whoopsie doodle. We just showed up and killed everybody with our with our fucking aura or whatever. I, mean, I guess like I would at, say as much as like we didn't have the germ theory of disease yet, but like sort of exculping white people and saying, no, it was just a harmless little accident. Like it's both like it was they meant to do a genocide. Maybe they just didn't mean to do it that effectively. I mean, there was like we literally gave out blankets to smallpox on it. Yeah. I mean, it, and there was you know multiple extermination orders. I had honestly forgotten about the smallpox blankets. Um, so they. Th- they knew, yeah, by that yeah, point. Yeah, they, yeah. they didn't need to understand germ theory to understand, like, wait, if we touch them with this stuff, it'll kill them. Right. My it's bad, allowed. everybody. I got the timeline wrong. Please no, it's do not fine. come for me. And, I mean, to be fair, most people still believe the virgin soil theory because it is so popular to make white people feel better about themselves. Sure. Um, it's only largely being combated in um, genocide study circles, which are very, very small circles. People constantly like to tell us to shut up. So, you know... It's nobody's fault if you believe that. Absolutely not. It's still taught in higher education, like in American history classes and universities. I won't go into, like I said, that's about as far as I'm going to go into it. But that's also the same thing you hear about um, the Arawak population of Cuba. It's not true. Um, the Spaniards were fucking insane. Right. Yeah, that doesn't. Yeah. Anyway. Can't say I'm, sh- can't say I'm shocked. Yeah. Objections to these conditions sparked the first serious independence movement, especially in the eastern part of the island. In May of 1865, Cuban Creole elites, uh, not earlier I said Cajun, I think I fucked that up. I meant Creole. I apologize. Um, oh, Creole you're elites. Just, you're just fucking up all over yeah, the Yeah, my bad. I meant Creole. Uh, also, my uh, bad again. <laughs> placed four different demands upon the Spanish Parliament: uh, tariff reform, Cuban representation in Spanish Parliament, judicial equality with Spaniards, and full enforcement of the slave ban. After a few years of half-assed Spanish reform attempts that really didn't address any of these, and they were never truly committed to, Cubans were pretty much over trying to talk this entire thing out and said, "Start shooting Spaniards," starting Good. the so-called Ten Years' War of 1868. Now, this might shock you. The Spanish res- uh, response to this uprising was pretty much genocidal. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Most colonial government course. passed several laws, arrested leaders and collaborators of the insurgency to be executed upon the spot. Ships carrying weapons would be seized and all persons aboard would be executed. Males 15 and older caught outside of their plantations or places of residence without justification would be executed. All towns were ordered to raise the white flag or otherwise be burnt down and executed. Any women caught away from their farm or place of reverence would be taken to camps where they would be executed. Yeah. I was I was right to hate the Spaniards. No, you're always right to hate the Spaniards. I know we have some Spanish listeners, guys. You're fine. This is your fault personally. (laughs) Like 
I, I hope that you've reconciled with your histories. I know that, I mean, I'm American. Who am I to judge, right? Yeah, right. I feel that in my bones, Joe. <laughs> we got some things to work through together. Um, uh, now, none of these rules apply to white Spaniards, unless you happen to be like a collaborationist. But very rarely was that the was case. That, oh, that was my next question. I was going to ask how frequent collaboration was. Now, as the majority of the rebels were black, Creole, or other mixed race people, the Crown inflicted their violence against any racial minority they came across, transforming the entire thing into an island wide race war. Great. Now, reports of Spanish atrocities trickled out of the island. The Cuban rebels found themselves an unlikely ally, the United States of America. Now, remember, America is incredibly close to Cuba. It does not take long for news to travel, even in this day and age. Sure. And this is where I uh, will start to. Now, I know you talked about yellow journalism. People who are listening, the first thing that probably popped in their mind is yellow journalism regarding this war. This is where I'm going to lay uh, my my evidence that yellow journalism really didn't have anything to start this war. Because yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in this because I was like the narrative you're taught in school is that like. It was because of yellow journalism that we did this. Like, yes. at least that's what I was taught. I definitely wasn't taught about, like, you know, imperialism or thirst for empire or any of that. I was taught, like, basically they did a tricksy on us and we feel real bad if we feel bad at all. Um, there's some truth to that. Uh, I mean, someone made a lot of money selling fake newspapers uh, or fake news in newspapers. Um, right. I'll let you be the judge after we talk about this if you actually think it swung much opinion. Um, now, also, we both lived through the Iraq war, and we know that public opinion doesn't actually matter all that much. No. <laughs> w wanted a war and got one, man. Yeah. Like, uh, literally record-breaking anti-war protests did not matter. I was there. Yeah. Uh, now, this is not the first time the U.S. had laid eyes on the island of Cuba. As far back as the 1820s, Thomas Jefferson thought that Cuba should join the United States, not as a colony or a territory, but as a state. He also told Secretary of War John C. Calhoun, quote, ought the first possible opportunity to take Cuba. Now, at this point, they saw Cuba as just valuable land. They didn't see like they didn't care about the people there. I mean, this is the U.S. They saw it as very, very close to the United States and very, very valuable. But that would change, that the importance of Cuba would change. This lust for Cuba eventually morphed into something somehow more sinister when uh, southern states began to uh, pay attention to it. Oh, is this golden triangle shit? Yeah. In the 1840s, southern states, their backs starting to be pressed against the wall on this whole owning people as property thing, saw taking Cuba as a state as a solid way to bolster themselves in Congress, as Cuba was home to half a million slaves. President James K. Polk, a southern slave owner who defended the practice of slave owning, dispatched a guy named Romulus Mitchell Saunders, because people Jeez. used to be named a lot cooler back then. Jesus. <laughs> a, close friend, a close totally friend. A close friend. dude. Great name, though. A oh, plus huge name. Huge bastard. Um, huge bastard. Uh, he was a close friend of the president and minister to Spain, which I this is what they kind of called ambassadors back then um, to negotiate possibly buying Cuba from the Spanish. There's a small problem though. Saunders was a fucking idiot. Uh, he had only gotten the job because he helped Polk get elected and he did not speak Spanish. James Buchanan, another asshole further joked that quote, he even sometimes mur murders the English language. <laughs> Oh. Um, <laughs> Saunders offered the Spanish government $100 million, which is a lot of money in today dollars, to buy Cuba. And they laughed in his face, saying they'd rather sink it into the ocean than sell it to the United States. Owned. Oh, yeah. that's, that's pretty good. Also, this entire th the Spaniards, but. this might shock you. This entire thing was supposed to be a secret mission for the South, uh, which was ruined yes. by the fact that Saunders openly talked about it wherever he went and then quit his job uh, all within two years. Now, that's, that's <laughs> horrific. Fast forward to 1851 and be another attempt to separate Cuba from Spain, this time called the Lopez Expedition. Now, Risco Lopez is what is known as a freebooter. Uh, have you ever heard of these guys? Nope. Uh, now, it's a very nice way of saying pretty much mercenary. Um, ah. He invaded people for money. He wasn't Cuban, but instead was Basque and born in Venezuela and, pro and previously fought on the side of Spain against the Bolivarian Revolution led by Simon Bolivar. Dick. Yeah. Uh, he, Not he, Simon Bolivar. Simon nah, Bolivar. He's all right. Was, he was fine. Yeah. Um, 
this guy pretty much was just down to fight whoever for a check, which, you know, who am I to judge? I was right. in the U.S. Army. You, you also literally did do that. Uh, I was not a freebooter, at least. Um, no. <laughs> joke, joke is saving it, everybody. I, uh, yeah, Splitting I'm, hairs, babies. I may have fought in <laughs> Afghanistan, but I did not fight to uh, secure a slave state. So uh, point me, uh, <laughs> Lopez Zero. Um. Now, after the Spanish got their asses stomped at the Battle of Maracaibo, he retreated to Cuba, uh, and Lopez kind of followed them along the way. Uh, once there, they were forced to flee to the United States after going broke and starting a business and becoming an anti-Spanish partisan somehow. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, a, a a weird career arc. Careers? Yeah. Yeah. Once there, he decided he would be the one to free Cuba from the yoke of Spanish suppression and give it to the United States. Um, guy. He met up with a guy named John O. Sullivan. Now, if that name does not ring any bells, I don't blame you. He just so happens to be the guy that literally came up with the term manifest destiny. <laughs> oh, it's like a cornucopia of bastards. Oh, it gets better. <laughs> now. John O'Sullivan, this might shock you, was very popular in the South because he was a hell of a freebooter. Um, now, he also put Lopez in contact with various other Southerners who would throw money in to support his dumb plan. This kind of freebooting was also known as filibustering, and it was incredibly common among Southern slave owners of the day to attempt to slap together a private army and expand and take over more territory that they could then turn into slave states and territories. Um, this is pretty popular. A lot of presidents try to put a tam- like try to stop people from doing that because this is literally private warlords expanding the United States. Yeah. Um, President Zachary Taylor had told Southern States to cut that shit out by this point, however, and he ordered Lopez's dumb mission to be broken up. This did not slow Lopez down. He once again Bro, struck out. Stopped, you, know? yeah, you, you got you to keep it up. I mean, at this point, he is the freebooter guy. He's got to keep freeing them boots. Um He struck out again looking for Southern support, eventually finding the support of a Mississippi senator you may have heard of, Jefferson Davis. Oh, no. Uh, For people who, again, aren't aware of that name, he's the future president of the Confederacy. Uh, At this point... He's a bitch boy. He's a bitch boy, Joe. He at this point he has a winning record for the most point. Uh, he I know what had, happened, Joe? He had a <laughs> uh, putting up nothing but L's after this. Really, <laughs> uh, he had a record fighting in the Mexican American War, and Lopez thought he would need you know actually trained military officers to help any of his you know invasion of Cuba. He offered Davis a hundred thousand dollars and a quote very fine coffee plantation if he joined him. Oh boy! And yeah, I, normally I'm sure Davis would be like, "Ah, you had to be at plantation, good yeah, sir." Yeah. <laughs> but uh, he almost took the deal, but he was actually talked out of it by his wife, uh, Jefferson Davis, noted wife guy. Um, but Jefferson's like, you know what? I can't help you, but I do know another guy uh, who fought in the war who might, Robert E. Lee. <laughs> uh, oh, me a surprise. <laughs> Now, yeah. Lee also very nearly took the deal. Uh, but if, if if you haven't listened to our episode on Robert E. Lee, uh, go back and listen to it. Uh, he was up to his sure. tits in debt uh, and he couldn't sell his farm. Um, like there's way too much. He owed way too many people, way too much money at this point of life. So he, there's no way he could get out from under it. So he had to back out too. Don't worry. The union had a solution for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm convinced that Robert E. Lee uh, joined the Confederacy just so he could skip out on debt. I don't know I, if that's true, but fuck I, it. I, I'd buy that. Yeah. I have no um, reason to not believe it. He had a lot of debt. Um, turns out not a great plantation owner. Uh, he, the only thing he excelled at was getting stomped by fucking U.S. Grant. And How are you slaves. losing money when your labor is free? Uh, he inherited all of his land, and uh, the person that he inherited it from was really bad. I think it was his father-in-law uh, at running it. But yeah, then he continued being bad. But fuck him. Uh, so with Lee out of the picture, he did get some support uh, from other Southern politicians, like the governor of Mississippi, John Quitman, who funneled tons of money into the operation. Um, eventually, Lopez's dumb invasion set out and actually did capture the town of Cardenas before having to retreat back to the U.S. where everybody got arrested for violations of the Neutrality Act. Um, this is actually somehow the second time we've had to bring up the Neutrality Act to this podcast. Uh, the first time was when a whole bunch of Nazis tried to invade uh, somewhere. But 
Uh, now, mo- pretty much everybody was able to dodge prison time, uh, and John Quitman was forced to resign uh, because even back then, the uh, politicians were at least kind of held accountable when they did crimes. Wow. Can't but, relate. I mean, honestly, it's kind of shocking that Quitman had to resign uh, because like, he was governor of Mississippi. And he'd be like, look, no, I'm just trying to expand into more slave states. And people be like, oh, no, that's cool. But like, uh, you know, it's he violated the Neutrality Act. <laughs> it's kind of a big deal, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but Lopez wouldn't quit. He launched another invasion, August of 1851, which failed as soon as it stepped from the island. And Lopez and all of his followers were captured and executed by the Spanish government via garrote. Wow, that... That is a heck of a method to do it. Now, think of how much different American history would be if he got both Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee to go with him, only to get strangled by Spaniards. If only, right? Give us a time machine. I'm going to go back and talk to Robert E. Lee, but not for the reasons that you think I will. Mm-hmm. You're like, look, there's going to be a, a Bosque guy that shows up. I'm going to need you to go with him. Um, now, this is really the downturn of the freebooter movement, uh, though there was some other attempts and they were about as successful as this one. Uh, and, and some people have probably rightfully pointed out that this is the point that Southern slave owners moved away from the idea of expansionism to save slavery and instead moved to secessionism. Right. So, you know, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, though that did itself didn't end the American South's thirst for Cuba. Only a few years after the failure of Lopez in 1854, during the presidency of Franklin Pierce, people cooked up another idea. Pierce was pro-slavery Democrat from the North who was very pro the Southern cause. It is he who we have to thank for the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the effective repeal of the Missouri Compromise, which led to a prequel civil war known as Bleeding Kansas. Yep. Yeah, he's a dick. We'll talk about Bleeding Kansas at some point in the future, I'm sure. Now, this uh, violent little detail gave Pierce some pause when it came to fucking around with more slave states, worried about, you know, more violence. Uh, And his administration set up uh, the annexation of Cuba pretty high on their list of shit they wanted to get done, worrying that the slowly weakening Spanish Empire might fall victim to this British or French. uh, And they'd be able to steal that sweet succulent island before they could. And, you know, then they'd have an enemy (laughs) nation right there. I don't um, love the fact that you said sweet succulent island. That sweet succulent island meat. That's I right. Don't, I don't like that <laughs> phrase. It's fine. I can say it. I'm on an island. Um, <laughs> kind of even so, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. Uh, I'm going to post a notes app uh, apologizing for using the term sweet succulent island. I will do better. I hear you. <laughs> I see you. We'll do better. Um, we probably now, won't, but I, we'll, I can we'll, promise we'll you I will not I, do better. I guess. I've never once tried to do better. I'm not going to start now. Have you met us? <laughs> Another thing Pierce and his slave owning bu- business buddies were worried about was Cuba was eventually going to break away from Spain uh, in like as an independence movement and become, quote, Africanized like Haiti had been. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. That <laughs> feels that. You know, I don't need to say that feels that's that real bad. Is real race. That's real bad. <laughs> like the, now, by Africanized, I only assume uh, by the racist tone given, they mean ran by the people who live there. <laughs> um, now, instead of framing the entire thing as salvaging slavery, uh, because that would not ring great in Pierce's like support base, they instead decided to frame the entire attempted acquisition as a form of national security, leading to the Ostend Manifesto. Oh, jeez. Now, the manifesto is a replay of previous attempts by the U.S. to buy the island from Spain with the added threat. If they didn't, we would simply invade them. Now, this was a plot, not something they're actually discussing with the Spanish government. Like this wasn't like sending your your idiot friend to go talk to like an ambassador. Like, well, you hey, go uh, at the bar. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, not like old Romulus. <laughs> My friend over there thinks you're cute. And it's just <laughs> <laughs> we saw you from across the bar and we like your vibe. Would you like to give us Cuba? Uh, now the manifesto was supposed to be secret this is something that is a continuous problem in the united states government at this point nobody can keep a fucking secret uh all of this shit is supposed to be secret everybody's like hey yo we're gonna buy cuba um now a fact that nobody told this (laughs) this nobody told diplomat pierre soul uh who you know worked in europe uh, that not to talk about this shit at his day job while he was working as minister to Europe. 
And then what did he do, Joe? Well, Spain found out. They got pissed. Oh, no. As did people get back in Spain. Uh, clearly seeing this as a power grab, uh, an imperial like invasion. And also, Americans were pissed, too. Uh, generally, Americans sell us for exactly what it was. A fucking power grab for slave owners. Um Pierce's reputation was completely ruined and his own political party refused to renominate him for president. <laughs> this is the only time in U.S. history this has ever happened. I can't imagine. That's so fucking cynical, but I can't imagine that happening now. Oh, fuck because, no. Like, no. If someone like if someone like, if Joe Biden, that's that's saying he'd do this. But like, I mean, he is old enough to remember the first time we tried this. <laughs> but like if Joe Biden came out tomorrow, like a memo is like, oh, Joe Biden said we should invade Cuba and not because of like anti-communism, but like to help sl- with like spread slavery. He would 100 percent still sl- stand for re-election <laughs> in a couple of years. Um it's, it's it's every time I, I research how things used to be. Granted, people had to be like incredibly corrupt to actually get caught. But when they got caught, they had to resign. <laughs> or like, Can't admittedly, like, like at, uh, admittedly at this point, being a pro-slave northerner as president was way out. Like, was not popular anymore. Um, it, it it was it was not huge. Uh, but like they, this led to his party ele- electing uh, someone else to stand for the presidential election and led to the nomination of James Buchanan, a guy who is widely believed to have written the manifesto, the Austin manifesto in the first place. <laughs> and then and said, our, our first president from Pennsylvania. I grew up. Uh, he's from Lancaster. Not a good dude. He pretty much he, caused the Civil yeah, War. Good yeah, job. He did. He did. <laughs> good Thanks. job. Central Pennsylvania has nothing to contribute. Same as always. If it makes anybody feel better, Franklin Pierce died alone, uncontrollably shitting and vomiting on himself uh, from cirrhosis after years of being an alcoholic. Mood. So, yeah, Mood. good. Yeah. yeah, He deserved it. Um, <laughs> now, we'll also probably die of cirrhosis, but I'd like to believe we'll be surrounded by loved ones. <laughs> yeah, but at least we're cute. <laughs> uh, now, American designs on Cuba faded away for a little bit uh, because we took some time off amongst ourselves to shoot the South until they surrendered. Uh, And then, you know, back to the 10 years war. The U.S. is only a few years removed from the Civil War and saw the Spanish Empire as as slave holding oppressors, denying the Cuban people their freedom. That's Uh, a convenient change in attitude. I mean, like this is this is pretty new. Like, and uh, granted, this wasn't like the press. Yellow journalism hasn't started yet. We're still at like U.S. Grant era. Uh, this was like an American people thing. Like after we defeated the South, we thought that everybody else should kind of like have the same treatment like hey we'll shoot slave owners if we have to type thing. which all right Again. Now, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna do an imperialism right now this is an attitude clearly largely in the north and in government um this is not a a popular sentiment in the south but the presidential administration of u.s grant didn't really have any organized designs on cuba those were instead focused on the dominican republic and another hilarious episode of american failure we will talk about in a different time Now, but the Grant administration being focused elsewhere did not mean Americans themselves were going to stay out of it, because when do we ever? Huge fundraising efforts were made to be sent off to Cuban rebels, as well as guns and a few more, a few than, uh, or sorry, more than a few couple dozen volunteers would smuggle themselves onto the island. Because remember, not that far away. Now, Grant was talked out of just recognizing the Cuban uh, rebels as government by Hamilton Fish, his secretary of state. Uh, now, the reason for that was ongoing negotiations with the British. The British kind of wanted the U.S. to stay out of European bullshit, despite the fact the European bullshit was on America's front door. Um, so instead, he quietly told people uh, that were telling him to invade to shut the fuck up while also not enforcing the Neutrality Act whatsoever. So, oh, okay. like, so playing both sides. Yeah, any American who wanted to like go get squirrely in Cuba or like sell some guns or like send anything to the Cuban rebels were completely and freely allowed to. Um, The only thing that was going to stop them was the Spanish. Uh, Yeah. But by 1878, the 10 years war had fizzled out. Slavery was fully outlawed, kind of, you know, kind of like the United States slavery, both extra steps was implemented. Um, But they were unable to fully secure their colony as the little war sparked out next. Um, Now the little war, war is, Sometimes thought of its own, thought of as its own war, but also 
as a continuation of the 10 years war led by revolutionaries who had recouped and replanned while hiding out in New York of all places. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Goddamn New Yorkers. Yeah. I mean, that, that's honestly super common. Uh, like when we talked about, um, our expedition into Mexico against Pancho Villa, pretty much every time there was a popular uprising uh, in Cuba, they planned it in the United States. Uh, because again, it's very, very close and we just didn't care. Right. <laughs> um, now, this war did not find much popular support in Cuba. The population was just tired from decades of Spanish slaughter. Uh, so it fizzled out after a while. Um, after the Ten Years' War, Spain once again went on a crusade of terrible reforms. With slavery mostly gone, hundreds of thousands of freedmen entered the workforce. This made the previous plantation system no longer profitable because, you know, you have to pay people now. <gasps> oh, the horror. Yeah. Oh, no. Our, our brand of, of extractable capitalism is ruined. Um, I can't believe they would have done this to us. <laughs> It's that Eric Andre meme of, of them shooting themselves in the yes. chair. <laughs> Why now, would they do this? <laughs> unemployment soared, and the Spanish didn't really bother to do anything to help anyone other than themselves. Eventually, the Cuban revolutionary Jose Marti and a few others in the little Havana neighborhood of uh, Florida began to plot their next move. Again, like I said, of course it's Florida. Um, yep. <laughs> These were what were known as patriotic clubs, and they began to, one, plan the next revolution, but also worry that the U.S. could sweep in and take over Cuba before any revolution beco could become successful, which kind of ended up becoming a true thing to worry about. Um, but they were trying to play both sides of the fence. They knew it was in their best interest if we could, like, poke America with a stick enough to get them to invade Cuba. Mm. Like it would make their job easier. Like they like, look, we tried a decade of revolution and it fucking failed. But what if, if we, you guys? Yeah. If we get a whole bunch of fucking blue jackets that just you know got done warming up the rifles by shooting Southerners to invade, that would make our job a lot easier. Uh, it, it was 100 percent like make a deal with the devil type situation. Because remember, the Spanish Empire, while at this point is mostly like a fucked up old house about ready to fall over for its subjects that had been oppressed for 400 years they might as well be like the end boss of a video game right because like, you don't know feel that way. you still doesn't feel that way right 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 it's like i'm sure like that at, at this point it's like kind of like when the taliban finally figured out they won They're like wait we did it really <laughs> like <What>? you know? <laughs> um so at the time in the United States, the Secretary of State was a guy named James Blaine. Blaine, Blaine, James G. Blaine, continental liar from the state of Maine. Um, he was a man who decided it was his sole mission in life to end the era of American isolationism. Um, now, this might shock people, but once upon a time, it was actually like American doctrine not to fuck around against other people. Um, like the, there's the Washington doctrine of no entangling alliances, uh, which like meant that we didn't, you know, kind of get ourselves in a world war one situation where everybody's allied and whoop, war but started. Fights. We have no choice, yeah. which, you know, we found a way to do anyway. Um, and then there was the Monroe doctrine, which while the original intent was, you know, twisted to say the least, it was also to keep the U S out of other people's shit. Um, right. You know, keep keep us solidly in America shit, which would sometimes mean us getting involved in other people's shit. But generally, Don't they're isolationist. The right. Yeah, there was isolationist in nature. Now, obviously, things change. Now, Marty and the other planners watched the U.S. annex Hawaii, where I'm sitting right now. No problem there. Um, Way to go, Joe. Now, Hawaii is unique. Like, obviously, we've taken over a lot of territory over the years, but Hawaii was a free nation that the U.S. had recognized as a sovereign state, had done trade with, and had full, like, diplomatic relations with. So, like... And then what did we do, Joe? Uh, we gave it to a guy named Samuel Dole. <laughs> Enjoy your pineapples, bitches. Um, now... That's, that's actually a whole. That's a whole other episode. We'll eventually talk about. Okay, I mean, the, the, the eventual annexation of Hawaii is very weird uh, and dumber than you could possibly imagine. No, it's Joe. After years of listening to this podcast, nothing is dumber than I could possibly imagine. But fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, Marty looked at what we did in, in in Hawaii and was like, "Wow, that was like that was a kingdom," and they just took the like. Of course, 
Yeah, like, well, then they'll totally do that to Cuba, right? Right. Um, uh, Blaine said, quote, that rich island, uh, he wrote this on the December 1st, 1881. The key to the Gulf of Mexico is, though in the hands of Spain, a part of the American commercial system. Well, if ever ceasing to be thing. Spanish, <laughs> Cuba must necessarily become American and not fall under any other European domination. Uh, not to mention there's, an, there's more than enough evidence to suggest that Blaine had been working with Samuel Dole off the books in order to foster the coup that eventually toppled Queen uh, Lilio Kalani of the Kingdom of Hawaii. Uh, so Blaine's fucking around a lot. He, he has his hand in a whole lot of really bad pies. Genocide pies, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Though eventually Blaine left office when President William McKinley took office about two and a half years into the third Cuban War of Independence. Uh, which is what we would eventually get involved in in the Spanish-American War, is right. the third Cuban War of Independence. Um, Blaine was replaced in his position by a guy named John Sherman, a 73-year-old senator who, senator who everyone believed was already suffering from dementia even back then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, as the war raged in Cuba, McKinley didn't support armed intervention. Um, the U. Now, like we talked about before, the U.S. military was very, very small. Um, this is not like an. This is not like a de- rapidly deployed division somewhere type uh, part right. of American history. This is still very much a regular army of a couple thousand guys and then a national guard. Um, uh, like his predecessor, McKinley's predecessor, absolutely would have recommended an armed intervention. Uh, but McKinley instead wanted to negotiate with Spain. Uh, there was also a part played by American shipping and farming interests, which, strangely enough, were divided on the issue. American shipping relied. Makes sense. Yeah, like like it, it might not shock you too much when I say like it was in the shipping and farming industry's best interest if like the war ended and things then continued to be how they had been, because the Spanish let them do whatever the fuck they wanted. Right, like, and, and I say that like. It, when the other option is American uh, domination, the Spaniards still let them do more. So, right. and pretty much every sh- like the sugar industry, plantation, shipping, pretty much everybody's like, no, 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 we want you to help end the war between the Cubans and the Spaniards, but we don't want you to come and take it over. Right um, now, uh, there was some uh, like there, there were there was some outliers that did want America to come in, but uh, it was also because they assumed they'd get the same deal that like Dole got in Hawaii. But it didn't seem like McKinley really cared about that. Yeah, mm. obviously yet is for yet. a lot of sure. us. Uh, but most business interests actually favored the Spanish because remember they'd been there for fucking hundreds of years. Like, right. no, we, we, we want this, and all that, right? Yeah. Yeah. We want the status quo back where the Spaniards shoot anyone that disagrees with us and we make money. Um, now, however, none of this did any real favors with the American public who were demanding intervention. Um, now, the reason for this is because not yellow journalism, but a sadistic fuck named Valerania Whaler. Oh, good. He is Spanish Hitler. Uh, oh, okay. All right. um, Start out strong. All right. He had uh, been sent to... And actually, it's not fair. He wasn't the king or the prime minister. He's more like Spanish Reinhard Heydrich. Um, with the main difference of, unfortunately, nobody ever shoots Whaler. Um, He had been sent to become governor general of Cuba uh, after the last guy, a guy named Arsenio Martinez Campo or Martinez Campo had failed to put down the Cuban revolutionaries. Whaler was given full dictatorial emergency powers over the island, and he used them in the most horrific way possible. After running into the same problems Campo did, i.e. fighting an insurgency with a standing army that spent more time dying of disease than winning battles, he decided that the best way to stop the insurgents in their tracks would be to simply separate them from the population, loyal or otherwise. Oh boy, concentration camps. That's right. That's where the term comes from. Oh great, I did it. This because, So this is like the reconcentrera pop, uh, policy or otherwise known as reconcentration. And they were put in reconcentration camps. This is the first known ter- use of that term. Um, what do I win, Joe? Uh, three more hours of this. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. <laughs> um, now, like the British would uh, would directly. Now, a lot of people say the British were the Germans. Mostly, the British were the first people to invent concentration camps during the Boer Wars, which is what I had always heard. Right. This is where they got the idea. Now, oh, to be fair, their 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 camp system was much larger. 
Mm. Um, but uh, this is this is the first idea of, and I mean, we also attempted to do this in Vietnam with our strategic yes. Hamlet program. Yes. Um, we just realized we we can't call it. We can't use the term concentration. <laughs> just like internment camps, we can't. We're not concentrating people. We're, we're just turning them. them. Even the United States realized the term was poisonous. <laughs> <laughs> now the entire rural population of cuba was given eight days to move into designated camps where they be could where they could be watched by spanish soldiers anyone found outside of the camps after these eight days would be shot the housing in these areas what a nice change of pace that's right uh also pretty much every village outside of these protected concentration camps was burned um, so cool. people couldn't live in it. Cool. Food in the areas was uh, typically disgusting. Uh, housing was abandoned, decaying, roofless, and virtually uninhabitable. Uh, I said the food was disgusting. That's if there was any. Normally, it was scarce, and famine and disease quickly set in. Yellow fever is incredibly common in Cuba, um, as was malaria at the time. By 1898, one third of Cuba's population had been forcefully sent to concentration camps. These camps would eventually kill 10% of the entire Holy Cuban population. Shit. It's like that uh, island concentration camp in Namibia. Yeah, it's, it's Shark Island all over Shark again. Island, yeah. yeah. Um, as a Spanish Should government, change. <laughs> yeah, this is just uh, actually this is a little bit sooner, not, but not by much. <laughs> Um, as the Spanish government fully supported Whaler's methods, they were then shown all over the newspapers that made their way back to the United States, horrifying readers and nicknaming Whaler the Butcher of Cuba. Though unlike Grant, President McKinley didn't let violations of the law slip through, and the Coast Guard was sent to intercept the massive amount of weapon shipments that were trying to move from Florida to Cuba. Oh, wow. Yeah. As this was happening, a resistance movement began building in, uh, in the Philippines. So, again, Go listen to that. Uh, but now this meant Spain was caught fighting a two-front war across half the globe. Spanish soldiers in Cuba were dying by the droves, mostly by disease, but also by enemy gunfire. Um, now, like, I, I, we're going to talk a lot about people of dying from yellow fever uh, <laughs> during this series. Uh, but, like, I cannot underestimate just how many Spanish soldiers the yellow fever killed. Um, right. uh, at one point, half of the entire garrison was taken out. Um, like either killed or made combat ineffective. By 1897, Spanish forces in Cuba were forced to circle their wagons and only defend the major cities of the island, with the Spanish liberal leader pointing out that the Spanish didn't control any land they were not currently standing on. Hey, I've heard that phrase before. Yep. <laughs> it all comes back. Um, seeing the Spanish on the ropes, the American government once again offered to buy the island, and they refused. Uh, Spanish Prime Minister Antonio uh, del Castillo, <laughs> sorry guys, uh, announced that, quote, the Spanish nation is dispossessed to sacrifice the last peseta of its treasure to the last drop of blood of the, Span of the Spaniard before consenting to anyone snatch even one piece of its territory. He was then shot by an anarchist named Michelle Lombardi. Fucking Woo! owned. <laughs> <laughs> we got one! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I needed that. <laughs> That's fucking funny. Uh, was that last part important to the story? No. Does that matter? Also, no. Um, but yeah, so like this is all happening before uh, people are really talking about yellow journalism. Oh, okay. Um, now, <sighs> there is newspaper stories coming out. Some of them are inflated. Uh, like I, I think I saw one about the Spanish Navy feeding people with sharks or something Which like I'm sure that. They did. But like honestly, their um, exaggerations weren't far off. Uh, so it's it's it, uh, we'll talk more about it. But while all of this is going on, the U.S. is still negotiating. Um, at, at this point, the U.S. is starting to flex a bit more, knowing that Spain is weak. Uh, Spain said they would stop doing a genocide against Cubans if the Cubans agreed to a ceasefire. <laughs> <laughs> Now, obviously, the word genocide was not used, didn't exist right. yet. Um, the Cubans disagreed, hoping whatever happened next would bring the U.S. military openly onto their side. Uh, as a meet-in-the-middle type agreement, however, the Spanish government agreed to withdraw Whaler and replace him with someone who wasn't a fucking psychopath. It was. However, as is normally the case in situations kind of like this... Never mind, boys. 
Um, <laughs> Whaler had a quite a bit of support amongst the Spanish population of the island. Uh, so they planned a march in protest against his replacement, a guy named Ramon Blanco. Uh, these protests rapidly devolved into riots uh, as people were pissed that an outside government was flexing on the Spanish. This is something that they were not used to. Normally, it's the other way around. And soon these riots began targeting uh, targeting American owned business and Americans. Uh, as, oh, you know, hey, 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 whoa, 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 don't fuck with the money. What exactly. We don't fuck with the money. Uh, it is then that the U.S. dispatched the USS Maine to Cuba at the request of a guy named Fitzhugh Lee, a former Confederate officer turned Consular General of Havana and they nephew really of do not, Robert they really, Lee. They really do not name him like they used to. No, they don't. I mean, Fitzhugh Lee sucks, but Fitzhugh, solid name. Like, you could just <laughs> see the probable facial hair this guy has in oh, your yeah. head. Uh, like, it's the it's the sideburns going into a mustache, but without any of the goatee. Terrible. Yeah. yeah. Now, Fitzhugh Lee wanted the Maine to be a show of force to remind the Spanish government, like, hey, don't let these people fuck up too much of our shit. <laughs> um, there is also some argument of how violent this riot actually was. Um, it seems that there was some minor property damage. Mm. Um now, I'm going to take a short sidetrack here and address the one thing that I keep saying I was going to address, and uh, yellow journalism is the topic here. Uh, now Thanks, this is, Joe. This is the reason that is stuck in American memory as to being the driving force behind this war. That's because it's very easy to explain, and I do not think it was the case. Um, it's a lot like, I mean, we lived through the Iraq war. I'm assuming most of our listeners did, uh, or at least maybe, maybe they weren't old enough to remember like the, the press insanity that circled it. That didn't cause the war. Like the war was going to happen regardless. Um, right. uh, we can blame okay. journalists as much as we want. And to be fair, they do own a lot of blame for whipping people up into a bloodthirsty frenzy, but it didn't matter. Uh, and that's kind of the same thing here. Um, to me, throwing all this in a pile, of the like uh, a pile of falling for propaganda, is incredibly reductionist, and also okay. it makes it seem like just like the U.S.'s population went to the polls to vote to invade Cuba. Right. Uh, this propaganda wasn't impacting the government, who actually made these decisions. And remember, sure. Thomas Jefferson planned to take over Cuba. This is not a fucking new idea. Right. Um, I believe that this look at history takes agency away from both the American and Spanish governments to be terrible, as well as the Cuban rebels themselves to encourage the United States to get involved in the war, which they had been doing for years. Right. Um, now, for people who don't know, yellow journalism is, well, I guess journalism today. Um, it is a style of newspaper reporting that emphasizes sensationalism over facts, something that Thankfully, it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very fair and balanced. Uh, people often blame the style of reporting for the spread of anti Spanish sentiment within the United States. Well, it obviously added fuel to the fire. There's no denying that. It isn't like William Randolph Hearst flew down to Cuba and set up concentration camps or set shit on fire himself. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a famous saying, quote, you furnish the pictures and I'll furnish the war. That's often attributed to Hearst's. I assume he never said that. He never said that. Nobody ever said that. Um, it's at best apocryphal, um, uh, like third, fourth, fifth hand storytelling, but most likely completely invented by someone else and given to him. Um, remember, at this point of the American public's anger at the Spanish treatment of Cubans had been around for decades, literally since the 10 years war. Like the American right. people were throwing themselves on boats with guns and floating down to Cuba to shoot mm -hmm. Spaniards. Um, now I there's obvious, the right. yeah, there's obviously a lot of white savior shit here. I'm not arguing and saying that they're correct. Right. <laughs> like at no point am I saying that that's correct. You don't I'm have just, to hand it to the Spaniards. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just saying that like, they didn't read William or Randolph Hearst, Hearst and right. like, I'm going to go down to new Orleans and kind of paddle and do, and do myself a freedom fight. Right. 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 And what happened, uh, there was concentration camps. There was absolutely genocide. That wasn't propaganda. Spain did that. that that's like saying that, I don't know, um, uh, there's propaganda about the, the Bosnian genocide that's all fake to get the United States invade. Right. Like, of course, there's propaganda involved, but events still occurred that were real. <laughs> still, still a genocide. Right. Invalidating uh, maybe one part of that doesn't change the 
reality of the situation. Yeah. And again, I'm not saying that the U.S. is acting like in a humanitarian effort here. They uh, our founding fathers had designs over Cuba like but all of these things combined, it, it, the spark was not a newspaper. Also, like I've been like I've repeated time and time again, the American government was looking for an excuse to seize Cuba. Right. And that excuse was not William Randolph Hearst. It was something else we're about to talk about. Nobody with a newspaper was going to create this war of thin air when both the imperial ambitions of the American government and the liberation dreams of American people fueled by the genocidal reign of the Spanish already did that for them. So let's do ourselves a favor and not think a couple newspaper barons whipped up a war in a few months rather than the slow creeping of imperial rot and rise over the last few hundred years or so. So (laughs) when on the 15th of February, 1898, at about 9.30 p.m. And like, oh, no, that's some WTYP shit that that's about to say that, like, if there's one thing I've learned from, well, there's your problems when I put in the exact time, people are about to blow up. Um, Anyway, go listen to, well, there's your problem. Um, Thank you, Joe. I got you, buddy. Um, The USS Maine exploded three weeks into its stay at the Havana Harbor just to add fuel to the fire. Uh, now, actually, this is both the fuel and the fire for the most part. The war probably was not going to happen without this. Um, as most of the ships crew were below deck, either sleeping or resting in their quarters, 261 sailors were killed by the explosion of the crew. Only 94 survived. Uh, since most of the enlisted quarters were at the front and with the ex- where the explosion occurred, most of the deaths were enlisted men, as is always the case. Yep. Um, for my time. <laughs> yeah. we, we will simply put the enlisted men uh, at the front as another layer of armor. Um, <laughs> only two officers died, it's which is genius, sh- sir. Yeah. Uh, the officers quarters were at the rear of the ship. So most of them survived. Um, now, at first, Commander Francis Dickens told the president that this was an accident. The Navy, uh, Na- U.S. Navy Captain Philip Alger announced the explosion was due to a coal fire bunker or a coal bunker fire. Sorry. Um, these were both comments made by people who had no idea what had happened as they had not seen the wreck or had been there. That's funny how that works. Newspapers called for the heads of the Spanish, of course, who had clearly yeah. sunk the ship, despite privately Joseph Pulitzer, the main one of the main drivers of you know, journalism besides Hearst, openly thought that only a crazy person would think that the Spanish would have sunk the ship on purpose. Right, because why would they want a war? And the Spaniards were not ready for this war at all. Right. Uh, they, were, they were honestly losing Cuba without our intervention at all. It would, it would have taken longer, but like they were not winning. Right. Um, was, Spain was in some serious imperial decline. Um, people generally believe that the U.S. immediately jumped into war based on this explosion. Like the next day, there's Marines hitting the beach of Guantanamo or whatever. But that's not the case. Despite the public and various parts of the government demanding revenge, because there were people in the government like Teddy Roosevelt um, who were demanding that the U.S. go to war immediately, the government actually did something I didn't expect. They pumped the brakes and investigated. (laughs) Wow. Both the Spanish and the American governments launched an investigation into the explosion. Now, the Spanish won a joint investigation and the Americans refused. Um, Wow. And all investigations agreed that an explosion in the forward magazines caused the destruction of the ship, but different conclusions were reached on how the magazines exploded in the first place. What happened next is pretty obvious, uh, with the Spanish investigation finding that it must have been a fire in the coal stores that caused the explosion. They point out that there were no dead fish in the water, something that happens when an uh, underwater explosion occurs, like, you know, from a mine. Right. Um, the Spanish actions afterwards further prove that if they had sunk the main, it was completely an accident. Uh, the governor general of the island, Ramon Blanco, and various military this, commanders. This mine just says whoopsie daisy on it. Yeah, like they brought like the people are making it sound like they planted an IED for a boat and then sat by with a fucking right. control, pe- which to be fair is how some sea mines were detonated at the time. Like they had to be controlled that night. Oh, that's kind of sick. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, it was like electrical uh, underwater electrical charges, uh, which is another excuse. That the Spaniards had, there was no landmine. Like there's no electrical cables that right. could have powered it, but they also had sea mines that were triggered by bumping them. Sure which would become much more fragile over time as, you know, sea uh, salt water salt damaged them and articles right. got on them and whatever. 
But, you know, the governor general and various military governors or military commanders on the island came forward to show their sympathies for the lost sailors, something they probably wouldn't do if they killed them on purpose. Fair enough. Yeah. The American investigation found the main head struck a mine, which caused the explosion in its forward magazines. This was mostly based on survival, uh, survivor accounts who said they had heard two explosions and the fact that the ship's keel was bent inwards, uh, showing an outside explosion rather than outwards, which have shown an inside explosion. Now, to this day, nobody is sure what happened. Anybody who says that they are for certain is lying. Uh, like, there's no way to tell. Uh, but there is a fair amount of investigations that had been done. Um, both of these, po- both of these explanations are 100% possible. Uh, mm-hmm. But you can believe based on what there is. Um, I believe obviously it was an internal fire. Most historians believe it was an internal coal fire, but we can't be sure. Nobody can be sure. Um, the main had virtually no armor and even a small explosion under its waterline could have caused the magazines to go. Uh, and it was shown to have that flaw already. Uh, it was also the fact that uh, the U.S. used kind of an unstable coal in its ships, a bituminous coal over anthracite, um, meaning that one put off a lot of dust and any spark near it could have been fatal. Um, sure. Furthermore, that same flaw in that ship uh, with the coal dust and gathering and then starting a fire had just happened. Um, it really? just happened in the USS New York, okay. uh, which had the same brand of coal and sat for two weeks and began to burn just three hours after being checked. Uh, it was since that these things were powered by coal and coal explodes from time to time. You would have someone on fire watch go through and check the coal every couple of hours. Maybe it was every hour. They checked it pretty frequently. So the last check before the USS New York exploded was just three hours. Um, that's crazy. After being checked, and the main had gone 12 hours without an inspection. So it is very fucking possible. Not to mention that coal had sat in the bunker for three months, meaning right. it had plenty, plenty of time. Um, there had been several major investigations in 1910, 1974, 1998, and again in 2002. Though you can probably discount the last two as they were from the History and Discovery channels. Um, the, the best one that anybody has used has been the one from 1974, in my opinion, which used a lot of like computers. Um, like the guy that's considered the founder of like the American nuclear Navy did the investigation on that one. He's considered very, very good uh, engineer. Uh, but unfortunately, all of these investigations have come to differing possibilities. Um, the one in 1910 actually got to look at the wreck above the water uh, and said that there was definite signs of a mine explosion a wall in 1974 uh, showed that the other way, uh, like there was very obviously a a coal fire. Yeah. In short, the current academic consensus is (laughs) probably coal fire. But again, anybody who says they know for sure, it's impossible. You literally cannot. Um, Now I tend to agree with the coal fire scenario. It seems very realistic. Um, But my other theory is if Spain blew it up with a mine, it was a mine that had just been there and it bumped into it and nobody did it on purpose. Sure. It was an accident either way. Um, it, because there's, there's no good reason for Spain to do that politically and militarily. It made no fucking sense for Spain to drag the U S into war. Right. Because you know, it, they were like, losing. Right. Exactly. Um, and this is the 1800s, so the U.S. didn't have the greatest ability to investigate something like this. Not to mention, you have to look at who the investigation was done by, which was the U.S. Navy, who went by the answer that made them not look dumb as hell. Right. I.e., we blew up our own ship. <laughs> um, there's also it? conspiracy theory pushed by various people that the entire thing was a false flag. The U.S. blew up the ship on purpose. Um, because of course, that as well, because of course. Of course, those guys always exist. And the reason why this is still popular is it's actually the official stance of the modern Cuban government for some reason. Okay, well, fuck them. Yeah, that's very Sorry stupid. Sorry for now. <laughs> yeah, very, very stupid. Anyway, it wasn't until April of the same year that President McKinley finally asked uh, for a declaration of war. And it was after months of various Congress people demanding he get one while other members of Congress were drawing up plans to recognize Cuban independence before the U S even got involved directly, which would have forced Spain to declare war. Uh, oh, I gotcha. 
Now, eventually, the U.S. voted to demand Spain withdrawal and authorize the president whatever military needs, quote unquote, to make that happen. Uh, this also included the Teller Amendment, which forbade the U.S. to annex Cuba. It was it was made legally impossible for the U.S. to annex Cuba. Um, unfortunately, there'll be something else added to that much later on. But mm-hmm. as of now, good things. Uh, which I'm sure will. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I mean, the Teller yeah. Amendment, good idea when you're going to war. Unfortunately, everything else that gets signed into law afterwards, <laughs> not so good. Now, this is when the U.S. started a blockade of Cuba, something that would unfortunately become common. Um, which we, then, love, we love a blockade. Don't we worry. love a good blockade, um, and which forced Spain to finally declare war, and the U.S. declared a war in response. That is where we'll pick up next time. How you, you how, to- how you feeling so far about your knowledge of the Spanish-American War? Oh, I, I'm, I was really interested by your uh, yellow journalism bit and not at all surprised. You know, I think there gonna, there's going to be some well, people that disagree. Disappointing, right? Like, I, I feel like I disagree with you a little in the sense that, like, yeah, maybe a war that certainly, uh, to my mind, accelerated the pace. I think it, it would be in, it would be harder to it'd be easier to um, debate the importance of yellow journalism if the main never blew up. Right. Um, no, I, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, alas, I, alas, that's not the world we live in. I think the yellow journalism was definitely priming the fire in the civilian population, but that already existed. Sure. Um, that's fair. so, yeah, because remember they wanted to go to like the, the U S not like, not like everybody, obviously, but like a majority of people wanted to go to war during the 10 years of war, which was right. years earlier. Right. Uh, before William Randolph Hearst even started doing his shit. Um, or Pulitzer for that matter. But um, I think because like it seemed McKinley really didn't want to do this. Like he want like it, anybody else. Cause like, like we've pointed out the U S didn't have an army for this, which right. we'll talk about in part two is a lot of how the U S found this army. Um, so it was like, hmm. It's going to be a bunch of new dudes from New York with not all their limbs again. Kind of. Yeah. Uh, and ah, a special tradition. guest star malaria. Um, oh, but, that's less good. But it really seemed like McKinley was betting on this Spaniards cutting their losses, realizing they lost Cuba, and then getting $100 million out of it, sure. um, which is like a real estate deal, not an imperial thing. Um, right. But I, I think, like, obviously it had something to do with it. Just like <laughs> dismissing warmongering journalism in the u.s entirely is stupid but i also don't think it makes policy like those things don't influence yeah, that's people in government yeah, no, i i understand well i mean politicians do read newspapers and i suppose you could say you know one exists because of the other uh in terms of like making policy as a response to perceived public opinion but that's sort of a hazy road to go down and i'm not sure how valid that is that's that's pretty hazy, and I don't know how you'd measure it. I, I right, think there's exactly. a, there's a lot of it to like again, like reporting and propaganda uh, propagandization after nine eleven, which yeah. you know, we just sat through the twentieth anniversary of, and I do think that some of that's important uh, to contextualize and and how uh, you know the forever war eventually formed into being. But I also don't think it's as important as people think it is because mm. when you re- it's like people just watch the main explode. Which is, you know, obviously bad. Um, right. And I don't think they need to be made any matter by propaganda. Just like, I really don't think that like the Saturday Night Live song or like the WWF having a salute to people who died in 9-11 right. really change anybody's mind when you were watching 3,000 people die on, on loop on cable news. Right. You know, like I, I don't think the, the nudge was really necessary to make people mad. <laughs> Um, that's fair that's fair i don't know uh that's part one um and uh my fuck this is our plug zone plug your show uh listen to well there's your problem it's a show about uh engineering disasters from a leftist perspective and we tell jokes uh my book victory or death just came out by it it's the last one in the uh in my series congratulations by the whole series it's literally free if you have Kindle Unlimited. Just download yes. it. Give your money. <laughs> and until next time, don't invade Cuba. Yeah, no, don't do that. Don't do a, ger- a genocide. Don't build concentration camps.
Also, don't do that. I can't. Don't think of new names for concentration camps. (laughs) Later.